Hi, Bobcats. In this video, we're going to take a look at some review topics from GenChem 1 that are really critical to understanding the energy changes associated with phase transitions. Energy can come in lots of different forms, uh, such as kinetic energy or potential energy, chemical energy, thermal energy. The uh, type of energy that we can that we typically get out of chemical reactions is known as enthalpy. Thermodynamics is very, very persnickety about definitions and very, very minor changes in things uh, can result in significant impacts in terms of all of the equations and things from thermodynamics. In general, if you're looking at the heat flow from a reaction that is carried out at constant pressure, the type of energy that we're looking at is known as enthalpy, and the change in enthalpy will be equal to that heat flow at constant pressure. Now, why does that matter? If you think about it, most chemical reactions that we do on the bench top in a chemistry lab are done at constant pressure. Those reactions are exposed to atmospheric pressure, and over the time frame of a normal chemical reaction, atmospheric pressure isn't going to change. Therefore, most chemical reactions done in an open beaker or open Erlenmeyer flask on a bench top are done at constant pressure. The heat flow that we get from that reaction is equal to delta H, or the change in enthalpy. Thermicity refers to the sign of delta H. So if you have a, a reaction or some sort of a process where heat flows into your system that increases the enthalpy of your system, so we say that it's a positive delta H or a positive Q. Q is the symbol for heat. And um, that is going to raise the enthalpy content of your system. On the other hand, if heat flows out of your system or exits your system, we call it exothermic. The sign of Q or delta H in this case is negative because an exothermic process lowers the enthalpy content of your system. To help you uh, remember these, keep in mind endo is into and exo is exit, exiting. When we talk about endothermic versus exothermic, we talk about the system. It is endothermic when energy flows into the system. It's exothermic when energy flows out. So we've got to be very careful about what we mean by our system versus the surroundings. The system refers to whatever it is we are studying. If it is a chemical reaction, it is the chemicals themselves. It is not the solvent that they're dissolved up in. It is not the test tube that holds them. It is strictly the chemicals themselves. The surroundings are everything else. So the surroundings would include the solvent, the test tube, the test tube clamp that is holding the test tube, your hand holding the test tube clamp, holding the test tube, and so on. So basically, the system is the thing we're studying, and the surroundings are everything else in the universe. All right, so for our first concrete example, let's look a little bit more closely at a chemical reaction that's taking place in a test tube. The system, officially, is the chemicals that are reacting. The surroundings are the solvent, the test tube, your hand, your lab, and everything else in the universe. Here's another way of looking at this very specific example. The specific example is ammonium chloride dissolving, and this is an endothermic process. Being an endothermic process, as the ammonium chloride dissolves, it absorbs heat from its surroundings. Energy flows from the surroundings into our system. 
Okay, so our surroundings are the water, your hand, the test tube, and the lab. The system is the ammonium chloride. So energy is being transferred in the direction from the surroundings into our system that increases the energy content of the ammonium chloride. That makes it endothermic. Now, how is this going to be observed in the lab? Well, if you're holding the test tube and the water is giving energy to the ammonium chloride, the water is going to cool off and this is going to feel cool. That is not the defining characteristic of an endothermic reaction. The defining characteristic is this direction of energy flow. The energy is flowing from the surroundings into the system, making this endothermic. And in this case, this direction of energy flow makes the test tube, which is really the surroundings, feel cool. Let's look at a different chemical dissolving. When sodium hydroxide dissolves, this process is exothermic. So exothermic means that the system gives energy away to the surroundings. The energy flows out of or exits the system. So if our system is NaOH and energy exits the system, the energy flow or the enthalpy flow will be in this direction. It will go from the system to the surroundings. Well, when that energy is released to the surroundings, like the water that the sodium hydroxide is dissolving in, the water is going to heat up. And so this is going to feel hot. Feeling hot is not the defining characteristic of exothermicity. The defining characteristic is that the heat flows from the system to the surroundings. So with this direction of heat flow, the test tube, the water that's dissolving the sodium hydroxide, those things will all heat up. But the defining characteristic is that the flow of energy is from the system to the surroundings, so energy exits the system. So let's look at the system versus the surroundings for a different scenario, the scenario of a phase transition. A phase transition means that we're converting a solid into a liquid or a gas. So it's some sort of a conversion among those three states of matter. So in terms of system versus surroundings, the system is the chemical that's changing state. The surroundings are everything else in the universe, such as the heat source that you are applying to make this state change happen, or the ice bath that you are applying to make this, this change of state happen. So let's look at a very specific concrete example of a phase transition, that of ice melting. So we have solid water that is going to turn into liquid water. In order for this to happen, for the ice to melt, we have to put energy into the ice. Well, ice is the system. Everything else is the surroundings, the heat source, the lab, your hand, the container that's holding the water. So if this is going to happen, the system has to transfer heat. I'm sorry, the surroundings have to transfer heat to the system. The surroundings give heat to the system. Since the heat is going into the system, this is going to be endothermic. It is not a defining characteristic to look at temperatures. And in fact, when if you have ice at zero degrees C and it all melts to form water at zero degrees C, there is no temperature change associated with it. Normally, when ice cubes are melting, the ice cubes start at a temperature below zero degrees C, so the temperature does increase up to zero, where it remains constant while that phase transition takes place. But the temperature or temperature changes are not a defining characteristic. The defining characteristic is that energy flows from the heat source into the system, so from the surroundings into the system. On this slide, I just wanted to summarize the six possible phase changes, um, identify them as being endothermic or exothermic, 
demonstrate a very simple diagram that you can draw to help you always answer correctly whether a particular state change is endothermic or exothermic and what sign goes with it. Uh, and also briefly address the issue of state functions. So a lot of stuff packed into one slide. So first of all, our vertical axis is describing enthalpy. That's what uh, we're talking about in this presentation. But I also threw entropy onto this slide as well. Entropy is something that we will talk about in a later chapter. But if you're watching this video before the final exam, you should know what entropy is all about by now. For everybody else, ignore entropy for the moment. Okay, so when we're talking about the different states of matter, solids have the lowest enthalpy content, liquids have more, and gases have quite a bit more. So we've got a solid down at the bottom, and then the liquid, and then the gas phase. In order for the solid to turn into a liquid, we have to add enthalpy or add energy to the solid to make it melt. Remember another name for melting is fusion, by the way. Um, so if we add energy to our solid, that turns it to a liquid, but because we are putting energy into our system, it's an endothermic process. We are applying heat and that makes it endothermic is that heat energy is transferred from our heat source into our solid material and melts it. Ditto for vaporization. If we take a liquid and we add energy to it, we can turn it into a gas. So as we're adding energy into it, it's going to be endothermic. If we go in the opposite direction and start with a gas and then convert that gas into a liquid, we have to take energy out. You have to remove that energy um, in order to condense a gas to a liquid. And likewise, energy has to exit your system to convert a liquid into a solid. Now over here on the far right side, I've listed sublimation and deposition. These are the changes of state directly between a solid and gas, skipping the liquid phase. So if you take a solid under the right conditions and you add energy to it, it will go directly to being a gas, skipping over the liquid. That's sublimation. If you take a gas and under the correct conditions manage to, to get it to go directly to a solid without turning into a liquid first, we call that process deposition. Now, the gas phase has a lot more energy than the solid phase. So if sublimation is going to occur, you have to put energy into the solid to make it undergo sublimation to the gas phase. So that's an endothermic process. If a gas deposits out as a solid, well, since the solid has less energy, it has to give away its energy. So energy has to exit, making that an exothermic process. Now, what's the deal with state functions? State functions are thermodynamic properties that only depend on where you start and where you end. It doesn't matter how you get from one place to the other. So if we're looking here on this diagram at uh, the relationship between melting, vaporization, and sublimation, well, if we pair up melting and vaporization, we're going to start at a solid and end at a gas. Well, that's the same thing as sublimation. So if you look at the delta H for melting plus the delta H for vaporization, that should be equal to the delta H for sublimation. Because if you pair up melting and vaporization, you start and end at the same places that you do for sublimation. And so those delta H's should be equal to one another. Let me just go ahead and write that in. Delta H of fusion, because that's, that's the term that's formally used for the delta H of melting, uh, plus delta H of vaporization will be equal to delta H of sublimation. Now, if on a quiz or a test you're asked 
to give the sign of one of these processes, just sketch the energy level diagram with solid at the bottom, liquid in the middle, and gas at the top, and you should be able to get the right answer every time.